I was just 16 when I arrived with my mother at Manning Tree Station in February 1902. I was on my way to the Benedictine Convent in East Burgholt, where I hoped to spend the rest of my life as a nun. The first surprise that we had was that we were faced with a four-mile walk from the station to the convent. Miss Malt? Yes. Miss Margaret Malt. Say goodbye to your mother and come with me. Margaret Mould. Yes, Lady Abbas. Lady Lesher. But you may call me Reverend Mother. You travel by train? Yes, Lady Reverend Mother. To Manning Tree, and then on foot to the Abbey. The lay sister said I was to leave my mother at the gate. Quite correct. And you must have no contact with her or anyone else from the secular world for three months. This is now your home, and we are your family in Christ. You have already been told you may bring nothing from the outside world into the convent. Am I permitted to keep this small miniature of my mother? No. You may leave it here and give it to your mother when she comes to visit you. You must retain absolutely nothing from the secular world. You do understand that you must remain in the hospice for three days to make a spiritual tridium, a time spent in prayer and fasting to help you prepare for a spiritual life. You know it will not be easy. Are you prepared? Yes, Reverend Mother. Your novice mistress, Dame Catherine, will come and visit you in your cell this afternoon. She will advise you on everything you need to know. You must realize that until you are a postulant, you are confined to the church, the lay chapel, and your cell. You must have no contact with any other nuns until you are clothed in your postulant's dress. <coughs> Sister Justine will accompany you to your cell. God bless you and give you the strength to accept the hardship, the obedience, the austerity of a spiritual life devoted to the service of God. You must put on your habit now. Leave your clothes outside the door. They'll be collected and given to the poor.
For three days I was alone to spend my time in prayer and contemplation. Trays of food were left at my door, but I spoke to no one. Sometimes I saw nuns as I passed along the corridor, and I could hear them singing in the church while I prayed in the lay chapel. My heart was filled with joy to think of my future life as one of them. You will not need that again. My nightdress. After you become a postulant, your habit will be consecrated to God and must always be worn. Must I wear it day and night? That is exactly what you must do. Now you have been preparing for three days for your acceptance into the convent. You will follow me to the chapel. You must now kneel and knock on the door. Enter. What is your wish? To serve my vocation in your holy order. You may rise. An easy entrance is not to be granted to one who newly seeks a religious life, but in the words of the Apostle, prove the Spirit to see that it be of God. Dame Catherine is deputed to watch over this postulant, to see that she truly seeketh God and is prepared to spend her whole life in his service. now a postulant in the order of St. Benedict, and you must be prepared for a life of obedience and opprobrium. All your possessions must be given to the poor, or made a gift to the convent. From now on, you own no property, and you have no power, even over your own body.
I will leave you now. When you hear the bell for lunch, you will proceed to the refectory. When may I have a bath? Baths are not permitted by the Benedictine order. After matins, you may go to the kitchen and fetch a small can of water. What about my teeth? Thanks to the generosity of Lady Lesher, every nun is issued with a new toothbrush each year, along with a tin of tooth powder. You must realise what a great blessing this is, for very few convents allow such luxuries. What if I need to see a dentist? Then you may go to the infirmary, where a nun may be able to extract a tooth. If not, your name will be added to the list for the dentist. And when 20 or 30 are named, the dentist may be asked to spend a morning here. Until then, you must pray for strength that you may be able to bear any pain or discomfort until he is called. Why is this pen and paper on your table? For, for when I may write to my mother. This is a wicked sin of propriety. This time you are merely admonished. But if further such sins are discovered, you will be severely disciplined. When the time comes that it is appropriate for you to write a letter, then you may request the necessary items. Frequently, the nuns who had transgressed had to kneel and eat on the refectory floor, or sometimes be denied food altogether. food was very poor, usually vegetables, and sometimes so bad that one couldn't eat it. The abbess did not eat in the refectory, and her meals were much better. After Lords, nuns were allocated different occupations. The print room, which I dreaded because of the heavy machinery and harsh chemicals, the hot steamy laundry and the kitchens which were often dirty. We also had to cultivate the gardens and do the cleaning and maintenance of the abbey. Sister Rose, Sister Teresa, Sister St Anne. Sister Margaret, you will embroider this baptismal gown, which has been ordered by a relative of Lady Lesher. This is the design which has been chosen. You must be meticulous. Your work must be of the highest quality, and nothing less is acceptable. Thank you, Dame Helen. I will try my best. I am afraid my sewing may not be of the necessary standard. Sewing is something I enjoy. I shall help you as much as I can. Your stitches are so small and perfect. You must have been embroidering for a long time. Hush, we may only speak of religious matters. Sister Margaret, you hold your needle like a baboon. Unpick that dreadful work carefully and start again. Yes, Dame Helen. I'm very sorry. Embroidery brought a considerable income for the Abbey, but entailed long hours of minute, detailed work, often in poor light, which caused serious damage to the eyes of some nuns. Go to your cell, Sister Augusta. You must return at four. 
so that you can finish your work before you attend Lord's. Yes, Dame Helen. Sister Margaret, it is your duty to attend to the lamps. You have neglected to fill them. This is a serious case of negligence. You will report to Lady Lesher after Lords before you return here to work. Make sure all lamps are filled before you retire to your cell tonight. Yes, Dame Helen. Very sorry. You will leave the room ready for work tomorrow. Just finish the section you are embroidering. What did Lady Lesher say? She said I must prostrate myself on the refectory floor at dinner so that all the nuns may see my shame. She will tell them what I have done and make me eat my dinner on the floor. I told Lady Lesher I was sorry, but Sister Birchman's it seemed such a small matter. It was like that for me. I was knitting a sock and Sister Hilda said I should knit more loosely. I tried but she was not satisfied and she pulled out the needles and made me start again. She said I must learn that obedience is the Sister greatest Margaret virtue of Sister Margaret and Sister Birchman's, you may not speak. Friendships are never to be permitted between nuns. The love of God is allowed. You wish to see me? Yes, Reverend Mother. I have now been here for three months and would like to ask permission to write to my mother. Yes. But you may only use this one sheet of paper. When you've written your letter, you may put it in the envelope on the tray, but leave the flap open. I will see this posted after I've made sure the contents are suitable. Thank you, Reverend Mother. I have written to my mother asking her to visit. I pray she is able to come, but of course you do realise the grill will be between you. However, I'm sure you'll be overjoyed to see your mother after so long. Does your mother visit often? Alas, very seldom. My family lives so far away it's difficult for them to come. But I pray for them daily, and I know they pray for me. And I will pray that you shall see them soon. Oh, Mother. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. Oh, and I you. You look so pale and thin. Are you well? Yes, but I must work hard to achieve perfection. Are you having enough to eat? I do not always like the food. My friend... Although it is forbidden for me to call her so, Sister Birchman's sometimes helps Sister Mildred in the kitchen. She says it is very dirty. She does not know how we are not ill. Sister Mildred makes her scoop fat from the stock to make the pastry. It is often very bad. But we must eat it or kneel on the refectory floor, holding out our plate, so that all may see we have sinned against poverty. Sister Birchman has seen dirty clothes amongst the food, and even vermin. She wants white maggots on the meat. Oh, but how does Lady Lesher stand for this? Surely she must know. I don't think she does. She eats in her room. It is not the same food. But Madge, if you are so unhappy, will you not come back to London with me? No. Oh. It is my fault. It is wrong of me to complain in this way. I must try harder for perfection. God wants me to prove worthy of him. I'm unworthy. Oh, your hands, or oh, your, your pretty hands. How can they be this way? What has happened to them? It is the lie that we use to clean the printing presses. It reacts on my eczema. It is nothing. We must endure suffering if I am to unite with that of the Lord. We must suffer all to win his salvation. You must go. I should not be speaking to you of such things. I will go and confess my weakness to Lady Lesher. Please go. This is my life now. I wish for no other.
You wish to see me? Yes, Reverend Mother. I am so unhappy. I fear I have no vocation. The way to perfection is difficult at the beginning. But you must be comforted and accept the Lord. You must resolve not to let the devil take from you the crown that our Lord is preparing for you. Only by the utter sacrifice of your life will you win from God the salvation of those you love. You have persevered as a postulant, and I believe that it's time for you to prepare for your novitiate. But if not, I don't feel like... In my opinion, you are ready. And you will be clothed in the Benedictine habit and the white veil of a novice in two months' time. Reverend Mother, I fear I am not worthy. You still have many things to learn, much to overcome, but this you will do as a novice. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord have mercy upon us. The Lord have mercy upon us. Dearly beloved in the Lord, dost thou desire to be admitted into this community, to be proved for the work which we have undertaken for the glory of God and the practice of all the heavenly graces which we seek to cherish? I do desire. Jesus Christ, 
who did design to put on the clothing of our mortality, we humbly beseech thee to bless and hallow these garments which this hemmed maiden desires to put on. Receive this habit that you may wear it unspotted before Jesus Christ. I admit thee to be a novice into this community. You will be known as Sister Morris in honour of St. Benedict's beloved disciple. Lord, grant thy handmaiden that she give up her whole life for thee, to know all things patiently, to have all her affections given to thee, that you may be her joy and her portion forever. Dear Mother, we have had a great sadness here. Our beloved abbess, Lady Lesher, collapsed and died just after my novitiate. We miss her greatly, but rejoice that she is now in the arms of Jesus. That good woman has gone straight to paradise. Our new abbess has just arrived from Germany. She is much stricter than our dear Lady Lesher, but we pray that Lady Hildegard will follow the same path as her dear predecessor. I hope you will soon be able to come and visit me as a novice. Love, Madge. And I was so pleased to get your letter. You hadn't written for some time and I worry so. Are you happy? You don't look happy. I am happy enough. But I was disappointed that the bishop postponed my profession. It is wicked of me to complain. But Dame Warburger, a recent arrival, was professed before me. Why is that? Dame Warburger is very wealthy. Sister Birchmans believes this is why. Whilst I must scrub and wax the floor and clean the printing presses, she is allowed to sit in quiet study and does no hard work. I have endured so much, it is difficult for me to give up my rank of somebody because of the money they bring to the convent. I can talk to no one of this but Sister Birchmans, lest my word get carried back to Lady Hildegard. You sent for me, Lady Hildegard. I did indeed. Firstly, I believe you have complained that Sister Velberger is to be professed before you. How dare you imagine you have the right to question the bishops of my decision? You who come here a pauper, without dowry? I am very sorry, Lady Hildegard. The Benedictine rule states that monks and nuns should be professed according to rank. And I am before Sister Wahlberger. It is unfair that she should be professed first. You will be professed when the bishop and I say so. Do not dare argue with me. It has also come to my ears 
that you wrote complaining that the bishop had delayed your profession for another six months because the weather was too hot for him to travel. If you do not repent causing sorrow to that holy man, your soul will be cast to the depths of hell. Remember, the road to hell is paved with the skulls of bad priests and nuns. Now go. You will castigate yourself in 400 strokes. Yes, Lady Abbas. Dear Mother, after my disappointment, Lady Hildegard has unexpectedly arranged my profession. There has been so much unhappiness. I have tried so hard to be truly spiritual, but I feel that I should not take my vows here, but in a stricter house. I have confessed my fears to Father John, but he supports Lady Hildegard, and I must do as they say. I am to be professed very soon. I pray that God will help me to do his will. The next time I see you, I will have taken my vows. Oh, Mother, pray, pray for, for me. me. Love, Madge. I was indeed professed, although still filled with doubt. Even though I was now a nun and given the title of dame, I was still subjected to unkindness and even cruelty from more senior nuns and indeed the abbess herself. Pointless, niggardly tasks added to my feelings of unhappiness and frustration. However, I was still determined to fulfil my vocation and punish myself relentlessly in my efforts to achieve perfection. Dame Morris, the meal you carry to Lady Hildegard is cold. This is quite unforgivable. You must see that the food and the plates are hot. Then you must cover them and take them directly to the abbess's room. I'm very sorry, Dame Helen. I went as quickly as I could. If it takes you so long to walk from the kitchen to Lady Hildegard's room, then you obviously have time to spare. I notice that the gravestones of our dear departed sisters have moss growing on them. You will go now to the cemetery and you will scrub them quite clean. You must respect the dead as well as the living. But Dame Helen, the refectory bell will ring in a few minutes. You must put others, even those no longer with us, before your own selfish needs. When you have finished, you may ask Cook for a slice of bread. Yes, Dame Helen. Dame Morris, Dame Morris, let me help you with that bucket. Dame Morris is quite able to carry a bucket. Go about your business, Henry. You have no call to address any nun directly. Yes, ma'am. Dame Morris, I understand you are responsible for the cleaning of the presses, is that so? Yes, Dame Catherine, I've just done them. I've just spoken to Lady Hildegard, who informs me that the presses are disgracefully dirty. How can we print material well if the presses are not clean? Now that you have taken your vows, your behaviour must be exemplary. You must be an example to the prostulants and novices. I always clean the presses in water containing lye. It is very difficult to get into all the small crevices. 
I tried very hard. I'm sure they are quite clean enough. How dare you contradict what Lady Hildegard has said? It is your place to obey without question. You will repeat the process using a much stronger solution of lie. That way, perhaps we can print material that is worthy of the convent. Dame Catherine, my hands are very bad at the moment. They're red and swollen, see? Could I please be moved to a different occupation to allow them time to heal? You must know that you must bear pain and discomfort gladly. It is only by suffering as did our Lord that you will earn your place in heaven. Yes, Dame Catherine. You will pray for forgiveness while chastising yourself with 400 strokes. Yes, Dame Catherine. I'm sorry to intrude, Lady Hildegard, but I am worried that I have not yet heard from my mother. I left a letter in the posting tray about three weeks ago. I do hope it was posted. No, Dame Morris. It has not been posted. I was quite appalled by the letter you wrote. It is here. This letter cannot leave the house. I am very sorry, but I do not see what is wrong with my letter. Do not see what is wrong. You have put crosses for kisses. Oh, damn. This is not the behaviour of a true nun. You are forbidden to send any more letters. But, but Lady Hildegard... Do not argue with me. You are to scrub out the larder and report to Dame Mildred to work in the kitchens. meat has been given as a gift to the Abbey. I wonder if we could give some of it to the six sisters. We can but try. I will ask our lady Alice. Enter! My lady, some of our sisters are very sick. Some meat has been delivered as a gift for the Abbey. May I have your blessing to provide some of the meat to the six sisters? Go away, dear Maurice. Do not speak to me on such matters. You know very well you are to have the meat. My lady, I am sorry to trouble you, but I do not know. Then find out! But, but, my lady, I... Get out! Get out! Get out of here! Get out! You understand well enough. I do not want your hands to sully God's gift to us. Then why do you not put somebody else in my office if my hands do not suit you? How oh, dare you! You will do penance in the refectory for me. <coughs> Hand me the keys to your stores. Your vow of charity? Is this your gratitude to Lady Lysha who took you out of charity? Who took you in? You who should work harder than anyone else? You who came in without a dowry? My lady, your words are unfair. I try hard to obey the order. I know that I must constantly improve. Words, words, merely words. I am not taken in by them, Dame Morris. And do not think I am blind to the discontent you are fostering amongst other weak sisters. But you will not prevail. It is God's work we do here. In the name of heaven, how can you say such things? Can it be God's work to deprive the six sisters? Sisters who have given their lives to him. Can it be God's work to deliver the meat such as it is to your apartments and to your favourite so, Now we have it. Envy. Coveting what others have. Jealousy. 
Now we see Dame Morris for what she is, spiteful and devious. I fail to see how I can punish you without some assistance and advice. It is high time we had a visit from the bishop. Until I can arrange that, you will eat your meal, your reduced meal, from the refractory floor. And you will consider your soul. And you will consider what work is most suited for you in this house. I do not see how I can possibly stay. God knows I have tried hard to conform. But I cannot in all conscience be a part of this regime. Sister, will you not come with me? I dare not. I know nothing of the world outside. I pray that God will give me the strength to stay and sustain me. Surely our Lady Abbess will see her error. Oh, dear sister, you have more faith than me. We can go to my mother's. We will be safe, I assure you. Thank you, dear sister. Whilst we are here to serve God and love him, I have grown so much to depend on you. I shall miss you dearly. But my place is here. If your mind is clear on this, I will do all I can to help you. But we both know you will not be able to simply walk through the door. Oh, no, dear sister, you must not attract any suspicion to yourself. If my difficulties resulted in you being punished, it would be unbearable. I will write to my mother. You forget, sister. You may not send a letter without the blessing of Our Lady Abbess. Henry, could you step inside the kitchen a moment, please? Henry, I need to ask a kindness of you. If you can do nothing to help me, then I quite understand. As you know, we are not permitted to send letters without Our Lady Abbess's permission. If I trusted a letter to you, could you post it for me? Dave Morris, this may come as a surprise to you. But yours wouldn't be the first letter that I've posted by any means. Oh, bless you, Henry. Return in half an hour. I will have the letter ready then. That's all very well, sister. But how will you survive here until your arrangements have been made? I shall just have to eat humble pie and pretend to have accepted my lot. And the penances? I pray to God to give me the strength and courage to accept them with good grace. When do you think you'll be able to leave? I do not know how long it will take the letter to reach my mother. Oh, Dame Morris, I was just going to knock. What did you want? I only wondered if you were going to your dinner tonight. Presently. She must have heard. The door was open. We were speaking quietly. But was she there when I was speaking with Henry? I do not know, but I suspect we'll soon find out. Sister. It is best if you leave me for an hour or two. If my plan to escape is discovered, you must not be seen to be a part of it. Sister, I believe all is lost. Sisters Justina and Philippa are on their way back from my lady's apartments. I am sure you will not be surprised to hear that Our Lady would speak with her instantly, and that she is not to speak to any other. God forgive me for my lies. Oh, Dame Morris, she is after you. What can you do? There is nothing for it. I shall have to leave this night. Sister, I pray you, go and find Henry. Beg him to lead a ladder in the long grass by the south wall. If he is not there when I leave, then he can escape all guilt. I will gather what necessaries I can and hide until nightfall. Oh, dear sister, I had hoped to take a more dignified leave of you than this. 
Where will you hide? You must tell me the time of your going and I will do everything I can to help you. No. When I leave, you will be the first person to be questioned. For the sake of your soul, I will give you no information. That way you cannot lie when they speak to you. I will write to you when I am free of this place. Rest assured, I will find a way to serve God. Is there really nothing I can do? I feel so wretched. Yes, there are two things. If you can obtain a postulant's cloak without risk to yourself, leave it by the vegetable shed. It will cover the white of my dress. You can trust me to do that. And the second thing. Pray for me. God knows I need it now and in the days to come. Oh. Goodbye, dear sister. God bless you. I cannot imagine the terrors that had filled my mind. I did not dare ask anyone on the road for help, lest they returned me to the Abbey. passed by going in the same direction as myself. As I was hiding, I did not see who was in it, but I was soon to find out. What is this commotion? I have left the Abbey. And these sisters are trying to take me back against my will. For shame, Sister Morris. How dare you speak of us thus? 
What will you think of this night's work when you are on your deathbed? For the sake of the Lady Leisure who professed you, return! You are damning your soul! I pray you to let God take care of my soul, and I commend it to him if I am forced to come back with you! Sir, you must see what this is! In all conscience, you cannot let them take me against my will! Sir, this is not your concern. Our lady is distressed and does not know what she is doing. I know my mind very well. I will go to London to my mother. If your mind is truly made up, then you must return to the Abbey with us tonight. We will give you clothing and money, at least leave with some dignity. So you take me to be such a simpleton? I know very well you are in no position to do any such thing. You warn me to take a care for my soul. I warn you to do the same. Sisters, this is most unseemly. It seems to me that this young sister wishes to travel to London. I know nothing of your order or rule, but it is clear to me that she is currently in the secular world. You must know you cannot restrain her. I urge you to use reason or I shall be obliged to send for a constable. Very well, sir. We shall acquaint our lady with your interference. No doubt Dame Morris will remain here. But it is one thing to wish to go to London, and quite another to do it without money. If you make it clear to the Lady Abbess, in what spirit I assist this young lady, merely to avoid scandal for the Abbey, I will lend her the money to go to her friends in London. And so I escaped. I thought that my troubles were at an end. Little did I realise that I was shortly to meet yet another individual who professed a religious life, but in fact had stirred up considerable controversy by his actions. This was Thomas Sloan, Member of Parliament for South Belfast and President of the Protestant Alliance. My honourable friends, once again I raise the question of the need for a bill to be passed demanding the appointment of a royal commission to inquire into the necessity for the inspection of monasteries and convents. These institutions are self-regulating and responsible to no law outside their own walls. And yet rumours are rife about ill treatment and neglect suffered by many of the inhabitants. <coughs> Last year I requested the passing of a bill opening up these institutions to inspection. <coughs> this, you will recall, was supported by a petition of over 750,000 signatures, not only by those associated with the Protestant Alliance, whom I am proud to serve, but with many concerned members of society. This petition was ignored. I call this a disgrace on the house. I demand action now. The people in the House of Commons would read the cinematograph of the March Pass of Children, you know, Alexandra Palace. We may yeah. be able to get somewhere here. Well, I think it's time we were on our way. Thomas? Let's get started then, shall we, James? Believe me, good people, it is time to assert ourselves. We have seen too much idolatry and popery for our times. Your true faith is the Protestant Church of England. Are you prepared to allow all the corruption and pomp of Rome to swallow up your traditions? Of course not. Even now, those dreadful nunneries and monasteries are harboring and training more of the Pope's emissaries to subvert the truth. You all know that I have fought to get our government to force inspection of these places, but so far without success. What goes on in them? No one knows. They are a law unto themselves. 
If they have nothing to hide, why do they resist inspection? The time for tolerance is past. With your enthusiastic help, we can force the government to listen. We can force through a bill demanding these places open to inspection, and then we will see the true horrors of the influence of Rome. So I ask you now, sign up and support the cause. Keep the Church of England as your true faith and fight the creep of Catholicism. I sometimes wonder why we bother with these small villages. Why don't they join the cause? I think, Thomas, you expect too much of these village folk. They don't recognise these matters as having any effect on their lives. Many of them are quite godless. You're right, I think. As long as they have food in their bellies and a roof over their heads, then all is right with the world. This may be just the job we need. They'll love a good horror story. This is an opportunity from God, James. Find her. Find her out. We must have her to speak. Do anything to find her quickly. Mr. Stone, my daughter. May I firstly say how much I appreciate you agreeing to meet with me after all that you have been through. Mr. Sloan, I have read of your activities and I view your request to see me with some misgiving. Our religious views are very different. I quite understand. Please believe me when I say that my only desire is for everyone to know the truth. But your methods, Mr. Sloan. You have been expelled from your political party. I cannot be a party to that kind of extremism. I am a true Catholic, and I believe devoutly in that path. I will not do anything to dissuade from my faith. But your experiences in the convent, Miss Mulk, from the little that I have read, were horrific. You are surely not content that such practices should continue. The only way to ensure that such abominable treatment stops is to open up these places to regular inspection. With your help, that can happen. Mr Sloan, my daughter is trying to find her way forward after a significant change in her life. I will not allow her to be manipulated for your own political ends. I really do not see any point in continuing this conversation. We will wish you good day. My daughter has people to thank, and that is her first priority. I'm sorry. Accept my card, please, and if you should change your mind. May I inquire who is it you are proposing to thank? No one from the Abbey, I should think. There are two people from the Abbey, but the circumstances are such that I cannot thank them without causing them great difficulty. No. The people I would like to thank are the staff at Manning Tree Station. Without them, I dread to think what would have happened. My only regret is that I cannot offer them a more tangible expression of my thanks. Then at least allow me to help you in this. Despite our differences, I too rejoice in their Christian endeavours and would welcome the opportunity to be associated in recognising their help. Can we at least agree on that? The depth of feeling shall come from you, and the material symbols shall come from me. Very well, Mr. Sloan. Thank you. But I cannot accept your offer if it means I am under any obligation to you. Of course not. I should be delighted to assist. against my better judgment, I was persuaded to return to Manningtree to thank the kind souls who had helped me. Mr Sloan and his associate presented the staff involved with a handsome pocket watch each, together with a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs. And so once again, gentlemen, I would like to thank you for your kind intervention. For somebody that has known nothing of the outside world for six years, it is reassuring to know that true Christian friendship exists beyond the walls of abbeys.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, Miss Malt, may I confirm a few details? Is it true that the nuns were beaten regularly? Of course not. But some newspapers already reported on the beatings, and that solitary confinement was commonplace. Well, I can assure you that such comments have not come from me. Whilst the regime in East Burgholt was cruel, it did not extend to the practices you have just mentioned. And I would appreciate it if you did not associate me with such rumour and speculation. I'm afraid, Miss Moult, that you'll have to get used to being misquoted. It happens to me frequently. You will find that some newspapers will print what they wish, with little regard to what they have heard. But that is ridiculous. Surely a newspaper is interested in reporting the truth. There is a way in which you can ensure that the truth is heard, and that is by proclaiming it yourself to large numbers of people. Mr Sloan, I have no experiences of public speaking, and I have no skills to organise such worldly things. But I do have such skills, and together we could make a real impact. The people, and more importantly the government, would have to listen to first-hand testimony. Surely you would wish the lot of your friends at the Abbey to improve. This is your opportunity to open up the Abbeys and the convents to a proper system of regulation and inspection. Surely that must be a good thing. I do not know what to say. Whilst I cannot be associated with your religious views, I do see that something needs to be done. Please consider it, Miss Moult. I will be speaking at Manning Tree next week. I would be honoured if you would share the platform with me. You wouldn't need to speak for long, and I would be happy to bear your expenses. Very well, Mr Sloan. I will join you. you will understand. After entering the Abbey for quiet contemplation and a desire to serve my location, such treatment came as a great shock. And such unchristian behaviour must be made public. Nonetheless, my faith is strong and with God's help I will continue to serve him and do all I can to support the poor souls who are unable to speak freely themselves. Ladies and gentlemen, you have now heard something of the horrors that lie beyond the walls of the Abbey that is just a few miles from here. For several years I have been advocating reform for the need for inspection and control. Will you support me now? Yes. How many more day Morrises must there be before this government acts? You have now heard far clearer than anything I can have told you about the true practices of the Catholic Church. At last, we have a glimpse of the hellish practices of popery. For shame, Mr Sloan, you go too far. It is necessary to get the people roused, Miss Malt. Only then will they listen. I will let them know of my experiences, but I will not use them as a weapon against my faith. You are good, honest people who worship according to the one true Protestant faith. It is time we made the Catholics understand that the path to righteousness does not lie through secrecy and cruelty. At last, we have a glimpse of the hellish practices of popery. I will not be a part of this. I should never have come here. Your coming is a sign, Miss Malt. It is God's work that we do here, and you are a part of it. God's work, God, God, it is God's, God's work. work, it is God's work, God, 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 God's work, it is 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 God's work.